Um, so when, when, when Neil asked if I would, if I would um, co-chair this conference, one of my um, requests, um, some might say demands, was that we put front and center the concept of taking care of ourselves. Um, as lawyers, as, as spouses, as parents, we prioritize everybody else in our lives, our children, our partners, our clients, um, you know, our law partners, everybody, and then what's left. So the other thing that's very unique about being a, a lawyer, particularly a woman lawyer, is when you think about what we're trained to do as lawyers, we're trained to see disaster everywhere. <laughs> Everything's a problem, and we're here to solve it. Um, and, and the more I think about that, the more I realize for myself, I spend a good amount of my waking hours in fight or flight mode. And it is not sustainable. It is just not sustainable. And the other thing that occurs to me, and actually occurred to me last night, I had the absolute privilege of having dinner with all of the speakers from today. Um, and I was amazed at all these amazing, accomplished women in the room who felt like they were not amazing, accomplished women. So my plea to all of us is, we really need to do better at this. We need to do better at this for ourselves, for each other, and, and for the women whose lives uh, we touch day in and day out. Uh, and so, this is why we have this amazing group of women out here. Um, and I'll just quickly uh, introduce everyone real fast here. Um, Judge Bosford. Um, is she actually grew up in New York City? I love that about you because I'm from the Bronx. So, um, Judge Boxford, um, most of you know from her time on the court, um, but she also has taught here at Northeastern um, University. She has been honored in so many ways because of her. What's going on? Sorry, Neil. Okay. Um, among her many awards and honors are Judicial Excellence Awards from the Mass Judicial Conference and the Mass Academy of Trial Attorneys. Um, and she presently is serving as a Special Master for the Supreme Judicial Court, as well as leading up the SJC's effort on wellness for attorneys. Um, next to her is Brenda Finkbindel. Finkbindel. Cool. Thank you. And uh, I'll let Brenda tell her story, but she is a specialist in mindfulness training. And next to her is Erin Murray, who is an extraordinary nutritionist. Um, and to her right is Michelle Olins, who is an extraordinary trainer. And Michelle had previously been at Northeastern as the um, strength and conditioning coach for the women's sports here at Northeastern. Um, so, so you have an amazing opportunity to be inspired um, by these women. And I would love to, um, to turn it over to them one by one to talk about a number of things today. Um, and I think the first place I'd like to start is um, um, on challenges for well-being. And so, uh, Marco, if you don't mind, if you could tell us a little bit about the impetus behind the SJC Steering Committee for Lawyer Well-Being and what is currently being done uh, to support attorney well-being, um, both on an individual level and uh, the profession level. Sure. Uh, uh, the, the impetus for the SJC's effort, which started in October of 2018, was a study, uh, a report done by the, um, the National Task Force of the American Bar Association, coming out of their um, lawyer assistance program commission, or it's got some fancy name, but um, so. The ABA task force report came out in the summer of 17, and it divided up, it, it started by pointing out that the level of problematic drinking and other substance use, um, the levels of anxiety, stress, depression, um, were significantly higher among lawyers than the population at large, and also higher among law students than in the population, maybe the other student population, I'm not sure. Um, and, and so that the, the percentages, which I think, um, let me just give you some of them, but for, for alcohol, problematic drinking was 30, between 21 and 36 percent. 
men higher than women, <coughs> younger higher than older in terms of the profession. For depression, anxiety, stress, 28% depression, 19% anxiety, 23% uh, stress. And this was a survey done of uh, 13,000 practicing lawyers in the country in, in probably 2015, I think, the survey was done a report based on and a similar survey done of 15 students, over 3,300 law students in 15 schools with similar results. So um, that persuaded the ADA task force to make a series of recommendations that were divided into what um, employers should do, what regulators should do, what law schools should do, what insurers should do, et cetera. And one of the points made in that report was that the chief justices of all of the states as the group that regulates the bar in each state should undertake to study the well-being of the lawyers in their um, particular jurisdiction and do something about it. So um, we started, Chief Justice Gantz um, uh, began this effort in, let's say, last fall. And what we did, what, what we have is a steering committee of about 16 people with one person representing each of a variety of employment settings, because I, one of the, one of the, in, in my view, um, not, not problems, but one of the uh, less than terrific pieces about the, about the ABA report is that they lump employers all together. So the difference between public and private, small and large, doesn't really come out. I, I think most of the people they were talking to were larger firm lawyers, but it being the ADA. Um, so we, so we, we have a, on this steering committee, we have a large law firm representative. We have a solo practitioner representative. We have two representatives from the bar association, the Boston Bar and the Massachusetts Bar. We have public lawyers. We have the uh, Commission of Public Counsel Services, which is the legal defenders. Um, we have uh, in house counsel and judges. I believe that's kind of it. And um, so, there's, so all of those people then were tasked with forming subcommittees in their particular area and then looking within their particular area of practice or law school, um, at particular kinds of stresses, what was good, what was bad about practicing in that area of going to school. And, um, and our task is to come up with an overall report uh, in June. You might notice that's just a month away. <laughs> uh, see if we get there. Uh, I think we will because we have a very, very organized person running. Not me. <laughs> so um, there's a shot anyway. So that's that's kind of um, what's happening. I mean, I, I can talk a whole lot more about what I found interesting, but I think I'm going to. We'll, we'll get back. Yeah, if you could pass it to Brenda. Brenda, could, if you could, because there, I, I actually have so many questions for you, because a lot of people will want to hear about mindfulness. But if you're comfortable, I would love for you to share with us what got what experience got you out of Halen Door into a life of. Mindfulness. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and words of less. Words of less. So just to let you know what I'm doing now, I'm School of Public Health at the Mindfulness. I teach mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction. And mostly I go into businesses and law firms, judicial institutes, and law schools bringing this. But I did before that, I've been doing teaching this now for almost 20 years. But before that, I spent 17 years at Halen Door, a large Boston law firm, as a litigator and then the partner responsible for training and professional development. And people ask all the time, well, how did you make that shift? And it, the shift kind of made me. So by all accounts, I was successful there. I loved what I was doing. I had great colleagues and friends. And at the same time, I think I was totally stressed and out of balance for all 17 years. 
In fact, my first day as a summer associate, I was OPEC. <laughs> and so, you know, here we are, 17 years with, so my temperament is anxiety. And I've had that all along and chose to be a litigator. You know, <laughs> talk about, a, talk about a, a disconnect from head and heart. Um, and I always had symptoms of sorts. You know, finding myself eating a lot at different times and not even knowing at the time, but that's a symptom of something. And back aches and shoulder aches and stomach aches and, you know, uh, stress exhaustion. You know, a lot of stuff that most people have. And I really didn't think there was anything I could do about it. I even remember talking to my father and hanging up the phone. Dad, it's a law firm. This is just how it is. Click. And, and even when I understood that there were things that I could do, I didn't think I could. So uh, at age 40, with a three-year-old at home, really completely out of the blue, I was diagnosed with colon cancer, had major surgery and seven months of chemo. And I remember getting home from the hospital, sitting down and thinking, well, that didn't work. You know, I did it all right. And it didn't work. I couldn't sustain it. And I just made this decision, like any good lawyer, I'm going to figure this out and save the profession. <laughs> Not. <laughs> I think one thing I realized is there isn't any. Every one of us would be different in how we define well-being and balance and what we want. But there are some ways to make life much easier, even in the face of the stress where we're all dealing with in our country and in our person. And so what I've been doing since I left there is going around to people like this group and saying, you don't need to wait for a crisis. There's another couple of us I talked to last night. It took a crisis for us to wake up and say, okay, better do something. You don't have to wait and it doesn't have to be big. Little small things like, this is a trajectory and you keep going like this. If you make one little degree change over time, you change the course of things. So um, I'll talk more as my turn comes back around, but you don't need to wait. And there are things you can do and, and feel significantly better uh, earlier. So that's why I do this. Thank you so much, Brenda. Erin, I'm wondering, I know um, you work with a lot of different types of clients, a lot of um, um, challenging clients, and I'm wondering if you could share with us what are some of the biggest challenges women face uh, when it comes to our relationship with food? Yeah, so that's, that's a big one. <laughs> um, well, I would say one of the struggles of entering the nutrition world is there's an intimidation factor because of associate nutrition with weight loss. We don't associate nutrition with self-care, well-being, preventing illness, building resiliency, building adaptability and robustness. And the female body needs that. And our body has a lot of needs that in today's society are missing. So oftentimes the more the busier, the more successful, more of a powerhouse woman is, the less time she's making for herself. But she really needs that. Um, because even when you're saving the world, you have needs, and you need to be nourished, you need to feel safe, you need to feel heard, you need to feel cared for. And nutrition and the care that we give ourselves can really go into that. And so getting over that hurdle of kind of viewing self-care in a whole new way, which is not punishment, restriction, or dieting, instead is nourishing, self-care, self-compassion, Shelly uses that word a lot, I love it. Um, that is when we reorient our health value system. It's usually a way that we can get over that hurdle. And a lot of times when women come to me, we talk about goals, and I try to spend a lot of time getting to know someone first before I start making recommendations prescriptions because everyone is so different, has a different lifestyle, has different health status, has different needs. So what I like to do is get to know them really well, and then we start talking about goals. And oftentimes they think they have to give me a weight goal. And I say, if what we do today works in two years from now, what will your life look like? And that's how we'll know if we succeeded, perhaps. And oftentimes they try to think of a number, and I'm saying, I didn't ask for a number. <laughs> what would your life feel like? What would your body feel like? 
all these other needs that we have, and they, they have to spend time thinking about it. And we build what I call as a health value system, and we talk about what life would feel like if we felt properly nourished and, and energized and, and feeling good and healthy and resilient. So we build a health value system that's motivating in a way that's exciting and feels really full of self-love and not deprivation. And that's where nutrition in our food culture today, we have such a broken food culture and nutrition is ubiquitous with dieting. And that's so not the case. So trying to kind of break those shackles around the nutrition perspective and get into health. Really make some strides. Great, thanks. So Michelle, you're, you're the trainer in the room. Whatever you do, I, whatever you say to do, I always do. Um, <laughs> but tell, share with us a little bit, what is, what is um, health look like from a trainer's perspective? And how can women attorneys prioritize their health? Great question. First of all, I'm very humbled to be in a room with all of you. This is amazing. Sat next to Kristen last night at dinner. I came here and I was like, what is going on? <laughs> um, <laughs> so everyone wants these like magic tips and some sort of secret I can tell them to get started and take care of themselves. And really, it's so hard because you have to, some people have to change their entire value structure. So how we see the world as a whole is based on a hierarchy of value. And if you're not the first person or first value on that list, sometimes you have to like completely erase that and start over and make yourself that first priority. And that's why it's so hard. You completely have to make a whole new value structure sometimes. Um, one of the biggest things too is I think people associate exercise and also nutrition as well with aesthetics, the way people look. But really, the people you see on Instagram with like 10% body fat, they're actually pretty unhealthy individuals. Uh, so I think having the mind frame of health as how you feel about yourself, seeing what you're capable of doing, having a relationship with your body, and know that you're creating a with more robust organism, and that you'll be able to handle more stresses outside of the gym. And also associating exercise with just the gym itself. There's a lot of other activities that you can take part in to have self-care. And the biggest thing about that is self-value. They all fit kind of equation with that. Thank you, Michelle. So, um, Brenda, I think a lot of people have questions about what mindfulness is. And I'm wondering if you could give us a good description of what mindfulness is. And I, is it hot in here or is it just me? All right. Maybe then we could also walk us through a, a simple, short mindfulness exercise, and maybe we can all get recharged from that. Okay. And I'm giving you permission to say, Brenda, that's enough. Pass the mic. So okay. help keep me on the time that you have. Got it. Um, so does anybody have mindfulness practice here? So keep your hands up for a minute and everybody look around and see if you know someone or want to connect with someone and let them tell you what they do. That is the most powerful thing. And maybe there'll be a, a committee, I mean, a, a community that will get together and do this. So how many are new to mindfulness? Okay, great. So mindfulness has been called the most powerful inner resource for stress reduction. And really, it is about accessing our most uh, innate knowing about how to cope and how to use our capabilities to manage our life in ways that are healthy. So um, the most common definition of mindfulness from John Kabat-Zinn 40 years ago is paying attention on purpose in the present moment with curiosity or non-judgment. Paying attention on purpose in the present moment with curiosity. Now, I know that you have all come in intending to hang on every one of our words, right? Is anybody's mind wondering why you've been here for the last 10 minutes? <laughs> like 200 times? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I want to say congratulations. Everybody here is human, and you're all okay. So uh, sometimes I think I get to know what's go to groups and say, we're doing just fine. We have human brains. Harvard did a study that said 47% of the time, 
We are not present for what's happening in the moment. So that means we're lost in thought, planning, worrying, daydreaming, almost half of our life, which has tremendous implications for the quality of our lives and our work drive, which is why mindfulness is used for cognitive increasing, for um, diversity and inclusion efforts and leadership and, and health and well-being. If we're missing, we don't know what's going on and we can't make choices. So 40 years of research tells us that this, so mindfulness is also just enhanced the way <coughs> it's being aware of what's happening as it's happening. And there is something about focusing our mind to be fully here that creates, it can create enormous benefits, physiological, emotional, mental, of all levels. And allows us to experience a different way of being in our lives. So mindfulness is not synonymous with meditation. Meditation is one way you cultivate mindfulness. But there's many ways to strengthen the mind's ability to stay focused in a particular quality. So it's not just focus. The quality that makes it mindfulness is that it's friendly focus. Kind of focus. So if you're really hot and uncomfortable in here, you have a relationship with how uncomfortable you are or with the heat of the body. And without mindfulness, it might just be sitting here for the next 45 minutes, right? Oh, so hot, I'm uncomfortable. You know, it just takes us over. And with mindfulness, we might say, well, it is hot in here. And I can feel that and still be okay and be here. So we're shifting how we relate to the discomfort, to a pain in the hip, to a fight with somebody, to a traffic jam, or to our own crazy thoughts, the ruminating thoughts. Oh, that's just a thought. And so mindfulness helps us to see and understand what's happening inside and be able to make choices of that. that make sense? I mean, there's a lot, but I'm trying to give you. So I want to show you one way that mindfulness helps with um, stress reduction. It helps us work with our thoughts. So um, anybody here ever have, like, really frustrating thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> you know that I only do this. Yes. Oh, you were just saying yes. Okay. <laughs> Hey, me too. Me too. <laughs> I only do this because they say you have to teach what you need to know. So every day I get to say, breathe. And then I remember to breathe. So I, I'm right here with you. But a one way that it works is, so this is me, and this is a thought. The thought comes up, and before I know it, I have latched onto it, and it is going to take me for a ride. I can't believe Judge Botsford said that yesterday. <laughs> oh, what am I going to do? I'll never get all this work done. Oh, I forgot to make this reservation. My leg hurts. Oh, my God. What if I'm going to die from leg problems? <laughs> <laughs> we know this, right? This is exhausting. This is totally exhausting. So mindfulness says, it is my, we are literally training our minds. Some people call it self-hacking. But we're rewiring and we're learning from um, fMRIs and brain scans that we can actually rewire our circuits. It's not easy, but we can do it. So with mindfulness, we're learning to say, oh, there's a thought. Oh, God, I really want to think it, but I'm going to breathe. I see it. I see it. And what happens? Everything that arises falls away, right? So at some point, it falls away. Oh, and emotions too. And, you know, they don't always fall away right away. But in this space, we have choice and we have some freedom to make a decision about what we want to do about this. Do I want to think about it? Do I not want to think about it? Is this ridiculous? You know, the bumper sticker, you don't have to believe everything you think. Like, <laughs> you know, that's news for a lot of people, right? <laughs> okay. um, there, are many there are many ways to cultivate it, and we'll talk about it at the next go-round. But do I have two minutes, or should we wait? Do two minutes mindfulness? Yeah, I think, okay. I think everyone's ready Let me just for do it. a practice. Okay, so I just found the greatest toy. They're, um, I ordered them on Amazon. They come in 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes. So remember, I said this does not have to take a lot of time. And for those of you in a law firm, 
Point one. <laughs> point one. That's all. But this is. This is I didn't realize that's what you. Uh, it's two minutes. Okay, so we're going to do a two-minute sit, a practice. Meditation is not the only way to do it. Okay, but we're going to try something. So you want to take a posture that reflects that we're about to do something purposeful, that we're intending to pay attention for the next two minutes. And eyes can be open, but just sort of softly down, so you cut a little stimulation, or closed. So there's no real particular position, but, but just have it reflect actually a balance between ease and wakefulness. So we're so often 100 miles an hour or collapse. Can we be both alert and relaxed? So I'm going to start on two minutes. So mindfulness is essentially being aware of. So becoming aware that you're sitting. Sitting and aware that you're sitting. Can you feel your feet on the floor? The sensations of pressure maybe in the shoe or the sock? How about the feeling, sensations of the body in the chair? Maybe noticing the chair, and if you are leaning back, you might notice the feeling on the back of the body. And bringing awareness to the hands and how they're resting. They may be resting one on top of the other, or on the lap, or on the table. So no right or wrong here. We're just getting out of the head and dropping into the body to be aware of how it is right now. And in fact, you might even take a moment to notice, how is my body right now? Without judgment. This is curiosity. Is there anything that hurts now? We don't have to fix it or change it. Just letting yourself be aware of how's, how is your body right now? And bringing awareness now to breath that's flowing in and out of the body. You've been breathing all day. Well, and you've been breathing since you were born. This might be the first moment today that you brought attention to breath. So just feeling it moving in and out of the body. Breathing and aware that you're breathing. There's nothing magical about the breath, but the breath and the body are always in the present moment. So when you're scattered or anxious or worrying, you can get out of the mind and right here, we're in the present moment. Nothing to do. We're not trying to relax. Nothing to improve or change. And in that, so different from what we do all day long, we have a possibility of resting. So just taking a moment, hands on the lap, or wherever they are, feeling the breath right here, not needing to feel anything in particular. And you can open your eyes and actually see and aware that we're seeing a beautiful room of people and we can hear. So that's a practice, one practice, and I'll come back at our next go round and give you some ideas for integrating it. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Huh. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of everyone in this room knows how to work hard. Um, and one of my favorite expressions of late has become, if you work hard enough, what was your ceiling becomes your floor. Right? Think about that. If you work hard enough, what was your ceiling will become your floor. And in putting this panel together, I was hoping everyone would feel inspired to break through their ceiling and make it their next floor, whether that means you're going to start eating green vegetables once a week, whether that means you will dabble in mindfulness practice, whether that means you might uh, um, reach out to a friend who's struggling with an alcohol addiction issue, whether it means you're going to start exercising one day a week, Maybe if you're Nancy, rather than doing 800 laps, you'll do 810 laps. Um, <laughs> but whatever your, whatever your current ceiling is, let's make it your floor. And part of why we wanted to have this group here was to help give people the tools and the inspiration to start doing that. Um, so let's talk about where do we start? You know, a lot of people aren't doing a lot of self-care. Um, and a lot of us struggle with, with how to go about doing it. 
Um, and so I want to start with Michelle on this one. Michelle, what would you, where would you recommend someone start in the path towards fitness? You know, particularly if someone hasn't exercised in years or maybe doesn't have access to a fabulous trainer like you, where, where do women start? I'm first thinking my cell phone now. <laughs> Uh, again, but it's just so hard because you're definite everyone in here definition of health or what they want to get out of an exercise. Um, so I would say you have to understand yourself again before you attend to others. And a part of understanding yourself is the type of person you are. Because if you're a very extroverted person, maybe finding a community or a group of people that you can exercise with would be more of a sustainable strategy for you. If you're a little bit extroverted like myself and you're around people all day, the last thing you want to do is go be around people even more all day. We'll see you. But like, it just, I know my personality, I need time to myself. So a community-based strategy for me at the end of a long work day is not going to be sustainable. So maybe more of a private setting or Starting exercise routines so such as yoga, you are able to be physically active and also being mindful as well. Um, and also not associate, associating the gym itself, some sort of you know large fitness um, area, with the only exercise that's available. Finding a reservoir and going <coughs> for a walk for an hour, maybe that's a sustainable strategy for you. So I think self-reflecting on the type of person that you are and things that you can maintain. Um, I think that's the, the best way to kind of go about it. And also find resources as well from people that you trust. Parents probably good. Erin, okay. um, if you could answer the same question for people who might, whose, whose nutrition may not be filling their, uh, fueling their soul as much as they need or feel like the, we're the star and there's so many conflicting stories about do we do carbs, do we not do carbs, do, what are all the trends? Where, where, do, where does anyone start with uh, trying to find nutrition as a source of sustenance and, and uh, meat? That's a good question. Um, well, I think with the diet culture that we all get bombarded with, it's very hard to discern what's actually do. And that's a good <laughs> but this is excessive for another day. Um, what I would start with, and it's it almost sounds it either sounds too easy to some people or it sounds too hard. But I would start controlling the quality of your food. And when I say that, I mean less processed foods and preparing more at home. Because a lot of people with diets get worried about quantity, and that's the macronutrient wars. So our three macronutrients are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Those can be metabolized for energy transfer and used to create ATP. Everyone fights over which macronutrient is the worst thing ever, what's on a pedestal right now. Fat is very popular, people hate carbs, it used to be the reverse. So instead of even weighing and measuring our food, start with quality, not quantity. The quantity debate gets into a lot of diet wars and it's is kind of an inappropriate topic to put on a population level because our genetics are all so different. Our activity levels are different. Where we're at remotely in our life can be different. So quality applies to all of us. We all need vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats. We none of us want a vitamin deficiency. Most of us have some. Um, the average American doesn't get enough D, doesn't get enough magnesium. We need vitamin C and polyphenols for a robust immune system. Many women are calcium deficient, iron deficient. But that's the last thing a high powered lawyer needs is to be anemic and fatigued in the office when you're working 13 hour days. And I have um, a, a lot of female attorney clients who, who live that lifestyle. And um, when we start changing the quality of their nutrition, their results are super exciting and they get so motivated because they feel incredible. So it definitely is a change in the value systems like Michelle mentioned to so maybe start preparing more food at home, looking for more color on your plate, ch changing that quality. But it can also be truly one of the greatest investments you ever make. And hopefully the results will very quickly have you inspired and committed and enjoying the change and that's exciting and fun and awesome. Brenda, where would you recommend if people were interested in, in 
where do you start as someone who may not have been exposed to it other than your amazing team? Okay, so a couple of ideas. And by the way, I have four handouts that are out there. So if you haven't gotten them, please pick them up. Um, one of them will direct you to a website where I've reported a number of short mindfulness practices. And you're welcome. You can put them on your phone like an app. And so one way is to do a dedicated daily practice. And especially if you're going through a tough time, you just do it. There's this old saying from the 1800s, a half hour of meditation every day is essential, except when really busy and then a whole hour is needed. <laughs> it cracks me up. So, you know, even if it's five minutes, there's five and ten minutes. So one way is what we call a formal practice. The other way are informal practices. And they might be something like a one minute mindful pause. And you wouldn't believe how many breaths you can get in one minute. Sometimes I think I mistakenly set my timer because it takes a while. So you might do a one minute mindful pause or a one minute check in. Like, how am I? And then listen, not just how am I? Oh my God, I'm a little sad, but oh, <laughs> oh yeah, my God, when it hurts, it's like, and pulsing here, and, and I'm sad today. I mean, it, it's fine, but I feel some sadness, and boy, my mind's going 100 miles an hour. Oh, oh, yeah. And then you bring that in. So some of those are adding a minute or two. Then there's something, and I learned in a mindful leadership conference that I love, the phrase, staple it. And the woman put it on the board, and she said, here's the answer to everything, staple it. And what that is, is stable practice to something you're already doing. So you can bring, you can cultivate mindfulness in any way, eating, walking, five minutes. If uh, Michelle gets you exercising, like we like to listen to um, music or watch TV or daydream, that's fine, by the way. We can't be mindful all the time. We, it's good to daydream and plan and reflect, but if the first three minutes of an exercise routine isn't about distraction, but about I feel the muscles in my leg and my heart's pounding, and then let it go and go wherever you want to go. That that is something you can do. Um, brushing your teeth. So I was at a mindfulness and law conference, and somebody asked, "How do we bring mindfulness to the legal profession?" And the teacher said, "Most of us can't even brush our teeth mindfully. Let's not put the cart before the horse." <laughs> So here's my challenge to everyone. If you don't know, if you pick something if you want, but go home tonight or tomorrow morning and to mindfully brush your teeth means feel the you can hear me without this, right? Yeah. You feel the squishing, you put the tooth toothbrush in, you taste the toothpaste and the way it, the toothbrush feels on your mouth, and the foaming, and you the squishing and the spitting, and how the teeth feel. And then you go back to daydreaming or planning or worrying. But you just did like a minute and a half bicep curls for your mind. And when your mind wanders, you bring it back. And then it wanders and you bring it back. You can do that in the shower. Oh, the water feels so good. Okay, two bicep curls for the mind. So, and just so you know, it's not about stopping thoughts. It's about noticing when you've wandered and coming back. So actually, if you thought a hundred million times, but you notice and come back, that's the moment of mindfulness. <gasps> Sometimes I'll just say, oh, I'm back. I'll be walking down the hall 100 miles an hour and say, oh, I have a body, I have feet, I'm here. That's, we just want more of that. So instead of 47%, we have 48. So just so you know on the handouts, there is, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. You don't have to put the umbrella and pull me off. Um, so you have mindfulness practices for the workplace, and there's nine of them. And you can pick any one of them or find your own. Mine is walking. So whenever I walk to get a cup of coffee or to go to the copier or anywhere for 10 steps, I bring attention to my feet. I feel my feet. I feel my feet. What am I going to have for lunch? Come back. I feel my feet. That's it. That's the practice. So notice um, what you might want to do, even with, and there's a stop practice. That's good. Just getting to notice when you go on autopilot. Just notice. Wow. I just drove to work today and I have no memory of the ride. But, <laughs> you know, just because as soon as we're, we're halfway there, things change. Like, um, and quite one, one thing. Did anybody feel relaxed during that little practice? 
I never invited you to relax. I said, bring awareness. When we bring awareness, something shifts. You might notice you forgot lunch. Your back hurts, and it would be nice to just stand up for a minute and go, oh, that, you know? So not tr any of that. So you have a stop practice. You can figure out what your um, stress personal warning signs are and use the practices and everything else. Okay, Thank so you. that's where I'd start. Would you pass it to Judge Botsford, please? So, Judge Botsford, um, what, st what strategies do you see as being the most effective to address challenges to attorney well-being? You mentioned that you, you came across some interesting things as you were um, progressing with, with what your steering committee was doing. Well, I, I would say, you know, people talk about what Brenda's talking about, but I'm not going to talk about that. Because I'm, so I'm in that, what I think that we have focused on more is sort of more group stuff. So one of the things, um, just in terms of starting, was stress creation. And it cut across the board in terms of types of practices was the feeling of isolation, whether you were in a firm or, or anywhere. So what I take from that is the importance of finding um, uh, fellow travelers, I mean, people with whom you bond in your workplace, uh, because it just, whether it's to complain or whether it's to work together, so that 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 is one. Um, I think another thing that, that universally in all of these employment settings is that people talk about their fear of admitting that they uh, have some issue, whether it's anxiety or depression or fear about the quantity of alcohol they drink or whatever. Admitting that you have an issue that is a real problem for you and that you need help, um, it doesn't happen nearly as much as it should. So one of the, one of the lessons that, that I think we have collectively learned is the importance in organizational practices, whether it's public or private, is modeling from the top down um, and, the, and the critical importance of that. So it's really about group activity and, the, and recognizing that everybody, uh, as Brenda would say, is human. I mean, so that, but but that, that, is, that is coming from the top and that there really are resources available to help. In every state, we have a wonderful lawyer assistance program which will expand. So that's awesome. I heard it's interesting you bring up the social part of health. I heard something when I was driving home from our dinner last night about this heart study that was done. Um, and I didn't catch all of it, but the gist of it was they studied Japanese immigrants uh, to the west coast of California. And um, you know, Japanese people are known for eat, eating a lot of fish and having very low rates of heart disease culturally. Um, and, and scientists were really intrigued on the, about this and wanted to understand when people immigrated to the United States, perhaps changed their diets, perhaps did other things, what impact did that have on heart disease or were genetics enough to carry through immigrant um, maintaining heart health. And people really expected that um, Japanese immigrants who had changed, changed their diets and adopted more of an American style of eating would show more signs of heart disease. And contrary, that Japanese immigrants who were not adopting American diets but were sticking to more traditional Japanese food wouldn't. And they actually found that wasn't the correlating factor. What they found was, was how immigrants socialized. And immigrants who became more integrated culturally with American lifestyles, American work schedules, American sleep schedules, American sort of uh, craziness showed same levels of heart disease that Americans do. And uh, the Japanese folks who stepped, who kept a little bit more insular, maybe had not learned English, uh, maybe would stay closer to home, actually retained, regardless of diet, retained uh, the heart health that they that it was just really intriguing about how your heart responds to people that you're surrounded by. Um, so it, what we fuel ourselves with is obviously important. 
for who we surround ourselves with and the levels of stress that we expose ourselves to, I think is, is critically important. So I'm really interested, Judge Bosco, that you're you're seeing that too in terms of in terms of what you're talking about. Um, so so now we've got everyone committed to starting something, one step forward. How, how do we get women to continue self-care? Michelle, what do you find um, best motivates uh, your your the women athletes you coach? You know your clients. What do you what do you think makes for sustainable self care when it comes to exercise? Uh, so I have previously worked here at Northeastern University and got the pleasure of working with a lot of the female teams here. One of those teams is the women's ice hockey team. I don't know if anyone in here knows anything else. They, uh, they finished the third best in the country this year. Um, so they have international players from all over the world that play for their national team. That's not a small game. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need motivation from me um, at all. Uh, but I just recently started working in the private sector. And that's something that I've had to learn a lot. You know, they're not guaranteed to come back to me. Tomorrow after our session, whereas like the athletes here, you didn't really have a choice. <laughs> uh, so those things are very difficult. Um, I would say you need to have honest discussions with clients about what is important to them. Um, because a lot of people come in and don't have a goal. They just want to do the right thing in terms of this is something that they think they should be doing. Um, so I think having in-depth conversations and continuously asking questions about the underlying reason why they're there and establishing that and holding on to that and building on that, that's what's like making them come back and what's giving them sort of motivation to continue on. And sustainable strategies, um, I talk a lot about this in my, my own company that I have on the side, but um, you know, we all see kind of these images on social media of people doing Olympic lifting. Yeah, that's kind of like our perception of what exercise is. Those strategies for most of the population are not sustainable strategies. Uh, you probably can't do that type of activity for 50 years and nothing negative happens. Um, there are consequences to everything that you did. So I think the thing I would focus on the most is aerobic activity. So long duration activity and kind of working on, a lot of people call it like cardiovascular activity. I think that's the most sustainable strategies and probably a large amount of health benefits from that type of activity. Um, and then also the importance of the distance exercise. And again, people have this perception of back squatting 300 pounds is resistance exercise. And you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. And I think a lot of people don't really truly understand the benefits of resistance exercise, especially um, females, bone density, how it can actually boost your immune system, uh, how can it increase blood flow to your brain, things like that. So I, don't know, I would say finding a trainer or a community system um, or friends who value exercise to kind of keep you in line. And so having people around you to support you, not anything in life, right? Like you want that for your kids, people you love. Um, so I would say having people around you that support you in those activities probably will assist that in the, the most possible way. And then also find anything that you would enjoy. Um, and I think those are some, probably some of the strategies that I would recommend. So unfortunately, we, we need like a two-day, you know, <laughs> next year is two days, okay? No, we, we're running out of time, but I'm asking um, um, those on the panel who want to write down a quick uh, phrase or encouragement to those of you in the audience, maybe to inspire you to uh, meet that ceiling and make it your floor. And if you have your phone, you're welcome to take a picture at this point when everyone... Let me just make sure everyone's ready. Yeah? All right, so let's turn around our signs for our audience. Read them. Mine says, I believe in you. Brenda, like a compassionate friend, 
Stop regularly and ask yourself, how am I right now? Short moments, many times, anywhere, anytime. Thrive and be uncommon, yourself first. Thank you all so very much. I mean, here at Innovations and Law Firms, and we're running on the court, we're going to play a new book in 